their expectation that Jesus is going to return at any moment. They've waited for the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. And when their waiting ends, they find themselves in the midst of a revolution. The end of old things, the beginning of new. Immediately, immediately what they have understood about what it means to belong is undone as they begin to speak the language of the people who surround them. No longer is it simply about finding themselves content to sit among the 120, to huddle in the upper room, to move in ways and spaces that are only familiar to them. No, God is on the move. And the Spirit's breath falls upon them. Their eyes are opened just a little bit. Might. Is that okay? I feel like I'm cutting out. Are we good? I'm just looking at Alex. Okay. I'm just getting weird, <laughs> getting weird feedback. <laughs> so, perhaps for the first time, as Peter and John and the other apostles walk among those who have come for Pentecost, they see their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters who do not look like them, sound like them, or live exactly like them as one of them, as invited into the grandeur of the Jesus story. In a single day, the church expands its borders, multiplies its membership, and extends its reach. In a single day, it could seem that the work of the Spirit, the message of Christ, has reached the entire world. And so it would not be surprising if they had fully considered their work done. Their call to be witnesses fulfilled. But the Spirit is not finished their work. The Spirit is not finished undoing what must be undone and shaking what must be shaken and unraveling what must be torn apart. And so while the handful of followers find themselves learning about what it means to be every other thing, meaning those who are different are not excluded, male and female are not at odds with one another, the old and young can build and dream together, language need not separate them, places of origin need not keep them apart, the Spirit is doing the work of joining. But the Spirit is not yet finished. The Spirit continues to invite them to see and to be seen. Who do you see and who sees you? And for his entire life being carried to the temple gate. A man sees Peter and <laughs> I'm trying, I don't even have to switch. how excited you are to watch what's happening. <laughs> All right. Take two. All right. <laughs> Peter and John see a man who has been lame for his entire life being carried to the temple gate. And this same man sees Peter and John. These two, Peter and John, would have walked to and through this gate over and over again. It's a place they would have encountered from childhood at festivals and moments of celebration and worship. Perhaps they have even walked past this very man who was carried in that day. But something has changed. Or rather, somehow they are changed and now they view the world through a lens that requires them to see God, themselves, and those around them differently. On Pentecost Sunday, as tongues of flame stood over the 120, the entire world shifted. You see, for as long as they could remember, there was a story told about a God who demonstrated his presence and leading as a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. This story found in the Old Testament book of Exodus has always reminded the people that the God who liberated, liberated them did not just see them, but this God also longed to be seen. And so as the people walked the long road to freedom, God revealed themselves as a pillar of fire, a sign that God was among them. 
But tens of thousands of years later, when the spirit descends and flames of fire rose above the heads of the first to be called the church, something powerful is revealed. To catch a glimpse of those who are filled with the spirit is to catch a glimpse of the God who sees and the God who longs to be seen. This is a revelatory shift that tells the story of God in such a way that it can almost be missed if we don't take stock of the whole story. So you see, the God who sees, the God who longs to be seen, came as fire to those moving through the desert. He made themselves known through the voice of prophets for those moving through the ups and downs of what it looks like to live in ordinary and extraordinary times. This God was revealed through the Christ for those who could only see God if brought face to face with him. And now this same God, who sees and who longs to be seen, is made manifest through those who are baptized, filled, and led by the Holy Spirit, the ones called the church. The pillar of fire has now taken up residence, not just among the people, but within the people. The intention is that to see the church is to see God themselves. Who do you see and who sees you? Peter and John see the man lame from birth in his usual spot, right in front of the gate called Beautiful. Daily, he's placed there to seek some kind of freedom, some kind of reprieve, some way to be made whole. And for all of his life, he has imagined that his wholeness could be achieved from those who pass by and drop their coins into his hands. And so his expectation in this moment, as he sees Peter and John, are not that he would be made physically, spiritually, or emotionally whole. All he's looking for is enough to get him to the next day. But the God who sees, and the God who longs to be seen, is present and made visible because those who are his church are present. And so when he turns his eyes towards this duo and asks them for money, for something to help him get to the next day, Peter says, look at us. Imagine if those of us who are the church, those of us who are filled and led by the Spirit, had such courage to say with boldness in the face of those we see and those who see us that there is something worthy of looking at. Something unique to behold, something powerful to view and to bear witness to. Imagine if we thought it was worthwhile for those we see to be invited to see us. Peter and John don't have what this man is asking for, but they do have what he is looking for. They offer him liberation. And right here in the text is where it gets so easy for us to find ourselves in the midst of ableist ideas of what this means and what this looks like. But instead, let us remember that what he is liberated from is so much broader and bigger and more life-giving than moving from lame to walking. In that moment, as Peter and John say, stand up and walk, this man who has spent all of his life begging, wanting, and being looked over, goes from socially isolated to celebrated. He moves from one who lingers at the edge of the temple to one who can enter and worship. He moves from dependence on others to one who can now live out interdependence. He moves from one who must big, beg for less than enough to one who now has the choice to freely access more than enough. From ignored and stepped over to completely seen, from imagining God had bypassed him to knowing that God has seen him and God sees him, ableism would cause us to minimize this moment to simply being able to walk rather than to see what he is actually liberated from. That he is liberated from everything he was excluded from because of his disability. The man is seen 
by the church. And the man sees the church. The witnesses are witnessed, and what emerges is transformation. Oh, that we might be ones who can say with the surety of Peter and John, look at us. Willie James Jennings notes this moment like this. He says, in the name of Jesus, this disabled human is touched by his creator and given strength to his limbs. The sight of this man imagined as forever sitting and begging, now leaping and praising God, rightly turns all eyes towards him and draws a crowd to see and understand. Now he will be truly seen. Yet before the hurrying crowd turned to see, the work of the witnesses was to see. Disciples must be seen, especially by those in need. Even more fantastic, Disciples must call attention to themselves, not as an act of religious hubris, but as the absolute mandate of a witness. Who do you see and who sees you? Do you see your neighbors? Do you see your coworkers, those who lead and serve in your community, those who are a part of your close circles and those so easily left out of those circles? Those you encounter intentionally and those who are simply familiar acquaintances. Who do you see right where you are? But even more so, do these same people see you? Do they see you as one who can pray for them? One who can support them? Do they see you as one who will listen, as one capable of offering even a little bit of hope and reprieve? When they see you, do they see one who is called to be witnesses of the Christ? Not in a do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior kind of way, but rather do they encounter someone whose life and thinking is somehow connected to the idea of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven? Do they meet someone who is concentrated on the liberation of others, the tearing down of that which causes harm and the building up of that which leads to the flourishing of all people? Do they encounter someone who resembles the Jesus we meet in the Gospels, one afraid of those on the margins, one willing to stand between those unduly condemned and the rocks ready to be thrown by the religious? Do they see someone whose tables are extended, whose attitude and actions are ones of inclusion? Do they see one saddened and vocal when they encounter systems and practices that allow violence, inequality, poverty, and oppression to prevail? Do they see someone who is surrendered to love? And here is the challenge with these questions. Here's the challenge with this entire premise of who do you see and who sees you. You see, the days of our neighbors and friends having a mostly positive idea about those who follow Jesus are somehow seemingly behind us. For so long, those who make up the church have forgot that we are called to be witnesses of Jesus to the world around us, And instead, we have sometimes found ourselves as ones who are witnesses of power. We are witnesses to politics. We're witnesses of rhetoric and protectionism, supremacy, exclusion, ideology, and division. And for so many of us who do not espouse to that type of Christianity, it can feel as though we should do everything not to be seen. But when we put our heads down too low, And when we cast our gaze away from the neighborhood for too long, from the streets that we live on and the communities that we are a part of and the people who make up our our big and our small worlds, in that moment, we move away from being ones whose life and story reveal the revolution of the message of the kingdom of God. We miss out on working to change harmful policies. We miss out on supporting great organizations. We miss out on sharing ourselves and our homes and our talents with those around us. We miss out on praying specifically for transformation to occur right where we are. We miss out on feeding and clothing the poor. We miss out on abolishing poverty in its entirety. We miss out on pointing to the signs of beauty all around us, the picture of hope among us, the whispers of the spirit at work that surround us. We miss out on participating 
in the renewal of all things, in being a voice, a picture, a glimmer of shalom. The worship team can come up. So today, it's such an important question for those of us who say that we are called to be his witnesses to ask, who do you see and who sees you? And does any of it echo the words and the teaching, the ministry and the person of Jesus?